Dogman versus Googway. Dear Scary Stories NYC, down on the southeastern tip of Newcastle, Oklahoma, there is a bunch of land left to nature over by where the Canadian River winds. I tell you what, it's not very far from Boggy Creek. Not very far at all. The movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek had come out the year before when this happened, and that really legitimized Bigfoot to a lot of people. Certainly, all of us in Oklahoma and Arkansas and I guess Texas too felt a lot less shy admitting that Bigfoot and swamp boogers in general scared the bejeebus out of us. This was the summer of 1973 when it felt like Bigfoot was in the news almost every week. We didn't have social media yet, obviously, but the news was a lot more honest and open back then. They would be mocking, I admit it, when they covered Bigfoot or UFO stories, but at least they would cover them. Now it's not even considered news unless the government is involved. Maybe people were seeing monsters back then because of all the movies and TV shows and newspaper articles about these various seemingly related subjects back then, or maybe there were just a whole lot of monsters out in the American woods that summer. Anyway, it was in that patch of land just south of the Canadian River in Newcastle, near Boggy Creek, that my two friends and I saw not only the Googway, but a dogman as well. And we saw the two enter into a turf battle. If you don't know what a Googway is, don't feel bad. I didn't know the term back then either. Come to think of it, I hadn't any idea what a dogman was either. For years, I told the story as me and my friends seeing two very strange-looking Bigfoot creatures. I would describe to people what the creatures looked like, and it wasn't probably until the 1990s that people started telling me that one of the creatures was a werewolf or a dogman. And then it wasn't until very recently, like five or six years ago, that my grandnephew told me that the other one was a googway. I'm going to use those two words to describe them today just to keep from getting too confusing. But just so you know, back then, we called them weirdo Bigfoot monsters. Or sometimes we just called them deformed wood boogers. In order to paint the picture clearly, I'll give you the same description I've been giving ever since the incident originally occurred. My two friends and I were relaxing by our campsite in the late afternoon or early evening, just as it was getting dark. Suddenly, we heard a loud splashing in the river, and we got up to look and see what we could see. There was some kind of situation going on in there, but the crashing and the white splashing foam were obscuring what might be causing all this. All we could tell for sure was that whatever it was, it was heading in our direction. My two dear belated friends are no longer with us, so I will have to tell this story for them and in their memory. They were called Harley and Big Top, or at least those were their nicknames. Big Top had worked briefly as a carny, and Harley drove a Harley. Not very original, I know, but we were all young. Each of us had a different medical ailment that allowed us to avoid being in the service overseas, and since most of our other friends were either over there, had come back in bags, or fled for parts unknown, our friendship cemented itself. Big Top cried out that we were seeing a lake monster, and that we should run. Harley said, no way, I've always wanted to see a lake monster, and he wasn't going anywhere. We saw something coming out of the water. But it was a big hairy humanoid, not a fish or eel or dinosaur. It was just as incredible to see, though. It was a dog-headed, hairy hominid, what we now call the dogman. The three of us each picked a tree to retreat to and hide behind, and we each peeked out to get another look at that thing, whatever it was. That was when we saw something else come out of the water behind that big dogman. And that one looked an awful lot more like a Bigfoot, although it was far bigger than I had expected a Bigfoot to be. Both of these creatures were well over our height, 
and we were all around six feet tall. In the Boggy Creek movie, the monsters looked skinny and human-sized, but these two animal men were too big to be men in costumes like they had in that picture. The dog-headed one was very canine in his features, including canine back legs. The other one was like an ape man or a sasquatch, only it had a long snout. Not as long as a dog's snout, more like a baboon. Both had hair that went from very dark like a black bear to silvery in places. And another thing, although I saw them both stand on their hind legs at points, they usually had at least one of their front arms on the ground, sometimes both. So they would stand up and scream to scare the other one. Then they dropped down into a tripod stance while attempting to smack or grab the other one with their free hand. When one of them would begin to get away, the other might drop to all fours and race over to grab them and start the fight all over again. Both creatures had incredibly long teeth, and they knew how to use them in a most savage way. The Gugwe leaped onto the dogman, and the two of them began rolling on the ground, biting chunks out of their enemy, with their blood soaking into the dirty ground beneath them. They rolled into a tree that cracked and began tipping over. It was gonna drop right on our friend Big Top, and you never saw a man so frightened in your life. That's it. I'm going home, he shouted and ran out of there like a complete coward. It didn't take me and Harley more than a second to realize we'd better follow him because we three came there in Big Top's pickup truck. If he left without us, and he looked scared enough to do just that, then we'd be left alone in the forest with two giant, weird Bigfoot-type things. As much as I'd love to be able to tell people who won that fight, the true answer is we were all too scared to stick around and find out. We drove to a bar to calm down, and we told the story to the people in town. Big Top started bragging early on about how he wasn't scared at all, and we just let him say what he wanted because, you know, guys were buying us drinks. He was what you call embellishing the tale as he told it. I promise you I didn't exaggerate though. The entire thing might have lasted two minutes or three before we chickened out. But I know what we saw and it was a long snouted gorilla man fighting a dog headed man. They were both big enough to be the Anunnaki. Everything I know and I can remember I've already told you and that is the story of the time I and two friends witnessed the fight between Dogman versus Gugway. Listen here, people, I got something to say about our EP KCK. There's nobody greater than Casey on all of Earth or outer space. See, almost rhymes. Please join us in thanking this extra long two hour episodes executive producer, KCK our newest channel member, for making this episode possible. In return, we send them the links to our secret uncensored stories, as well as our 21 hours of archived scary uncensored stories, far too wild to ever run on this channel. And you can see them all too. Just join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or click the join button under this or any of our videos. We'll have more deets at the very end of the show, but now let's jump into our second of many Dogman stories for today. And we call this one... Dogman Thrives Underground Dear Scary Stories NYC I have a story about Dogman in Woodland, New Jersey. I don't care if you believe me or not because I'm not using my real name anyway. This happened when I was a kid, a really long time ago. I'm gonna guess and say the summer of 1972, but it might have been 71 or 73. We had family out in New Jersey that neither my mother nor my father ever said anything nice about. Yet we had them over our place once a year in the winter, and they had us over for a week each summer. I never understood why this was, since both mom and dad seemed to loathe all of them so much, calling them mean names like trash. But 
My sister, who we can call Sally and I, were always very happy to see our cousins. They had eight kids, four boys and four girls. At that point, the oldest would have been around 18 and the youngest probably seven or eight. There were two boy twins that we called the Twinkies and two girl twins that we called the Twinkettes. All of them seemed to live off the land. I never heard about anybody in that family getting a day job, but they were all adept at survival skills, including hunting and foraging for food. When we would visit them once a year in the summer, it was like journeying to another land. Google says Woodland is a two-hour and nine-minute drive from Manhattan, but it felt like we were in a primordial jungle on another continent. I never saw the area in any season other than summer in July or August, and maybe that added to the tropical, otherworldly feel, but it's not like I'm the first person to get weirded out by that part of the world. Woodland is situated in the Pine Barrens, a 20-minute drive from ground zero of that legendary place. Even as a kid, when we would visit out there, Sally and I would ask the others to tell us stories about the Jersey Devil. After all, the Pine Barrens is his birthplace and hometown. This isn't a story about the Jersey Devil, obviously. It's a story about the Dogman but people have been afraid of the area called the Pine Barrens for many generations. The fact that a million acres just two hours outside of New York City remains almost completely undeveloped, even now in the 21st century, well, that ought to give you a hint that the Pine Barrens is not an ordinary place. There's something off and weird about it. When I was a kid, I found that weirdness exciting and strange. As an adult, I just find it terrifying. So now let's journey back in space and time to the early 70s when two of my cousins, we can call them Jackie and Samo, after my two favorite martial arts stars, led me on an adventure that nearly ended my entire life story before it had a chance to even start. Jackie and Samo were my best friends out there in the forest wilderness of New Jersey. Jackie was a year younger than me and Samo a year older. We either hung out the three of us or it would be the three of us with Sally and two of our girl cousins who don't figure into this story. It was just us three boys on the day when we found the cave. Finding a cave is a very singular experience, I can tell you. It's almost like discovering another planet or an alternate reality. Everything is different inside a cave as opposed to outside. The lighting, the temperature, the odors, the mood, just everything. That's true even if you visit a tourist cave. But when you stumble upon a cave entrance when you're 14 or so, it feels like the most important moment of your entire life. What had happened was that Jackie's foot slipped into a hole or else the ground gave way and his foot slipped in. I didn't actually see it happening. He was walking behind me. He asked us to help him get his foot out, and we both tried pulling his leg up. We only succeeded in making him shout, though, so we gave up on that idea and began trying to dig more dirt out around his ankles so that he would have enough room to get out himself. Instead, we heard a cracking sound and the earth underneath us began wobbling like water. Then it dropped fast, but only about two feet. We screamed in horror, then realized the cave-in was already finished, and we had only been knocked on our butts. To boys that age, the relief of not having been hurt, coupled with landing on our butts, led to uproarious laughter. We had thought we were going to die. It seemed so funny to us at the time. And then, the second cave-in happened, and we dropped a good five feet tumbling out of our hole into a tunnel down under the woods in the Pine Barrens. This was a cave, and yet it was not a cave. Something looked weird about how straight the hallway was in front of us. Samo carried a flashlight with him when we were in the woods, and he flashed it around the hallway, touching the walls. 
hand-carved, he mumbled, and then we made him explain what he was thinking. The hallway was not a natural cave, he informed us. It had been chiseled out of the rock itself. This was a man-made tunnel under the woods in New Jersey, in a place where nothing of that kind is supposed to exist. We stood there, discussing what we were seeing and conversing about it. I wondered if the tunnel was this close to the surface all the way through, or if it only came up this far in this one location. It appeared that the tunnel originally continued behind us, but the cave-in that brought us down there had sealed any passage behind us off completely. We had the choice of either climbing up out of there or walking off into the darkness in that one mysterious direction. Who could have built that tunnel? How long ago was it built? Was it a colonial construction? Was this part of a hidden military base? Did the Native Americans carve it out? Or could this somehow be even older than the oldest prehistory that we know of now? Even if we had carbon dating equipment, you can't carbon date a rock, so I don't suppose we would ever have any way of knowing what human civilization had carved this underground passageway, or if it had even been carved by human beings at all. Well, I would not advise you to do what we did, but we went deeper into the tunnel to see what we could see. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any GPS. This was the early 1970s. We didn't even leave a note or anything that we could have done. We just went off into the darkness. Please, folks, don't try this at home. Well, I remember us walking and that parts of the ceiling were dripping. The hallway was completely straight for a number of minutes and then curved toward the right and began to seem less well-constructed and less rigidly straight. It was almost as though this part of the tunnel were much older or made by a more primitive people. This part of the tunnel widened and narrowed, with the ceiling rising higher and falling lower as we went along inside it. Soon, we were in a natural cave tunnel, no longer a carved-out tunnel at all. I expressed the notion that we had gone far enough and we should be heading back. Jackie and Samo told me I was crazy, that we had just started exploring. I countered that we could explore all we wanted once we got some adults involved so it would be safe. They said once adults were involved, we'd never be allowed in that cave ever again. We had to explore as much as we could before heading home for dinner, and then we would try to come back with a camera, but not with any adults. I didn't want to agree with them, but I knew they were probably right. The only time I was ever going to have to explore that cave was that day right then. It wasn't something that I could reschedule. So, even though I would advise any of you to head home if you were in that situation, it was the 70s, so I went along with my cousins deeper into the cave system. There was a point where we reached a fork in the pathway with one tunnel leading left and another right. We randomly went left first and soon became overwhelmed by a poisonous stench. There was a bat's lair down at the end of that tunnel. If we went further, we'd get sick, maybe die from the fumes coming off their guano. We were treated quickly out of there, back to the fork we had been at earlier. Samo said there must be ventilation of some sort back in the bat's lair or we would have smelled the guano a lot sooner. He reasoned that the bats must enter and leave the cave through an exit located in that room we never visited. So, there are multiple ways into and out of that cave. Jackie and I had already had enough and wanted to retreat, but Samo talked us into going down the other hallway to see what was down there. He promised that if anything dangerous lurked down that hallway, or more bats or whatever, that we would call it a day. Our curiosity was still piqued, so we went along with Samo and his flashlight, leading the way down the natural tunnel toward who knew what. This tunnel lasted longer than the other one, and something about the vibration in there kept the three of us 
silent and observant. I mean vibration in the 70s way as in the mood of the place but I also mean it as in the literal vibration inside the tunnel which became increasingly something that we could notice consciously. I thought it was a machine vibration because I was very into science fiction movies at the time. Even though the walls were clearly carved out by nature itself, I began to feel as though I were in a spaceship somehow. The walls and floor vibrated rhythmically. At first it was sub-threshold, but eventually someone asked the other two of us if we could feel that, and we said yes, we could. We didn't have to ask feel what. We knew it was the odd vibration that he was asking about. Eventually, the cave began to widen in front of us and the angle of the tunnel began to tilt down steeper and steeper. The ceiling remained too low for us to really see where we were going until we passed the lowest point, and then the ceiling rose. Now, we could see where we were going. We were heading toward a natural underground amphitheater, a circular cave within the cave. The vibrations were most definitely coming from there. We were awed, but not frightened, and we quickened our pace to see what was making the vibration. Samo's flashlight began to illuminate more and more, and we saw a mass of gray fur all over the ground of the large cave room, all heaving up and down rhythmically all sleeping on the cave floor in front of us, as far as the eye could see. Jackie whispered, Ground bats! And we ran faster to see our discovery. I remember feeling like a great explorer, and that we had discovered something that would make us famous worldwide. Ground bats! Bats! That slept on the floor! But... As Samo and his flashlight got closer to the big room, he stopped running so fast. Then, he slowed to a walk and stopped. I ceased looking into the cave and looked at him instead. He seemed stunned and confused. I turned to see what he was seeing, and I could see for the first time that those were not bats sleeping there in that room. Those were dogs. Big dogs. All uniformly gray. All asleep. All curled up. Cuddling with each other. Keeping each other warm. I'm afraid I'm the one who did it. I uttered some foul language to express not only my surprise, but my annoyance at seeing something as weird as this. It was a room the size of a small Broadway theater, and there were all sorts of levels to it, especially around the sides and the back. Every place you could look, there were these very, very large, sleeping, gray dogs. Their combined breathing and snoring had been creating the intense vibration that we had been experiencing. There had to be hundreds of them, and they were vibrating the ancient cave walls themselves by their mere presence. Until I cursed out loud, of course. Dogs have good hearing, as it turns out. Not one, not two, but a dozen of them awoke at once, and then another dozen, and then two dozen more. When they woke up, they lifted their heads and opened their eyes to see us. From every direction in front, little yellow golden lights flickered on. Eyes shine, coming from below us, above us, to every side. And the vibration changed from the feeling that the snoring had created into the kind of sensation that can only be made by a room of over 100 dogmen, all growling at once, one by one by one. They all began to stand up, only they didn't stand like you would expect a wolf to. These giant gray wolves all stood up on their hind legs, 
as though it were a huge clan of werewolves. They had massive chests like they had been working out. They were not dogs at all. At the time, we perceived them as a city of wolfmen or werewolves, but I suppose these days the term most people would use would be dogman. They would have been as tall as we were if standing on all fours, but reared back like that. They were literal giants, possibly nine or ten feet tall, maybe taller. Any one of them could take down all three of us with ease. We ran out of there, and I saw my life flash in front of me. I remembered each bad thing I had ever gotten in trouble for, and I felt remorse for the times I had gotten away with things. I remembered cheating on a test in school and lying about it. The teacher told me that he believed me, but I really had cheated. That was the kind of thing I was thinking about as I ran with my cousins through the natural cave system and back to the hand-carved tunnel. I can remember the feeling inside that it was all about to end and how sad I was that I hadn't been a better person. We made it all the way back to the hole we had fallen into. Samo did this Jackie Chan move of running at a corner of the wall, then bouncing off one side and the other to hoist himself up out of the hole as though by magic. I don't think it would even become a Jackie Chan move for years after that, but he was an athletic kid. He pulled us out, and we ran home, paranoid that Dogman was going to pop up out of holes and grab us. When we got back to the house, we quickly took showers and got changed out of our dirty clothes, not wanting to draw attention to ourselves and the adventure we had just had. What we didn't realize was that three boys that age, willingly taking showers without being asked, is the most suspicious thing possible. So, we got the third degree from both mothers and one father. We held firm against the enemy's interrogation, although it was fierce. We told them nothing, and eventually they relented. Lacking any actual reason to punish us, they contented themselves by telling us to clean up our room and get ready for dinner. While we were doing as we were told, Jackie and Samo, finally getting me alone in a calm moment, asked me, Who is Mr. McGillicuddy? I was shocked that they knew that name and asked them why they wanted to know. It seems that when I was running through the tunnels, I was shouting, I'm sorry, Mr. McGillicuddy. I had no idea I was doing that and I have no memory of it. Still, they couldn't have known that name any other way, so it must be true. Mr. McGillicuddy was the teacher who believed me when I told him that I hadn't cheated. I was apologizing to him because I thought my time on earth was about to end. When I told Samo and Jackie who Mr. McGillicuddy was, they couldn't stop laughing. It was pretty embarrassing. Both of them claimed the only thing they were thinking about at that time was saving their own skin. They never let me live it down that I was thinking about cheating on a test back in fifth grade while the dogman was coming hard up our rear. If you ever find yourself in the wilds of the Pine Barrens, please watch your step. You may find some places in which your footing may give way. If such a thing happens to you, then you too may discover for yourself that Dogman thrives underground. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back with a very short Dogman sighting report. But first, here's my new rhyme. Don't mean no harm, everybody stay calm, where you've been rejoined by Skitsy's mom. Please join us in thanking Skitsy's mom for making this episode possible. She's one of our channel members and you can be too, either by joining our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or by doing what she and her cat did by clicking the join link under this or any of our videos. She gets to see our secret uncensored stories that we put out each Sunday night. They're far too wild for this channel. 
She also gets to see our three five-hour specials. That's 15 hours of scary, secret, uncensored Dogman stories that only channel members and PayPal subscribers can see. And now, here's that new Dogman sighting that we just got recently, and I think you'll find it interesting. I have no idea if this is for real or if we're being put on, but the title of this next one is... Dogman thrives in the sewers. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I live in a port city in the United States, but I don't want to give any more details than that. Since the virus situation began, I've had a lot of time to myself, and I've been wandering down toward the old dock area. They started revamping it some time ago, and it's mostly torn down or repurposed. There are a few old buildings over near the shore that have these large rusted pipes sticking out of the sides of them. I've been told that the pipes used to carry sewage out to the water in the past during high tide, but I have never seen high tide rise as high as those buildings and I've spent a lot of time in that spot this year just bumming around. Nevertheless, I've been told by multiple friends and acquaintances that the pipes come from a now unused part of the sewers of the city. Maybe that's true, I don't know. One day, I was staring at the water so long, I think I had fallen into a meditative trance and I felt very peaceful. I wanted to stay there into the night, but I don't feel safe by the docks when it's dark out. I know that's foolish. The area is expensive to live in now. It's not like when I was a kid, and it really was a dangerous neighborhood. Nevertheless, when I saw that it was getting dark, I got up to go. On my walk back to where I live, I passed one of those buildings I told you about with the rusty pipes. This one has a pipe that looks large enough that I could crawl inside of it. In fact, I was just thinking that thought and glancing over at the pipe when I saw what I'm writing to you about. That thing that you show on your show, that werewolf that you paint or whatever for your thumbnails, I saw that. It was pointy-eared with a face like a feral monster dog, but it had a broad human chest and muscular arms as long as a gorilla's. It was mostly covered in filthy, matted fur, but it was missing in spots, as though the creature were sick or just living in garbage and very unclean. Now here's the amazing part. The monster that you have in your thumbnails was climbing out of the freaking pipe in the wall. It was a big, muscular, hairy caveman with a monster dog head, and it was climbing out of the drain the same way a cockroach would. Well, that's the end of my story. I ran home and that was the end of it. You can ask me any questions you want, but I can't tell you anything more than what I just did. I saw what I saw, and if you want to call me a liar, I don't even care. I saw that exact thing from your show, or at least I saw the top half of it. So if you want to know where dogmen or werewolves live, I say, grab a shovel and dig, or better yet, Lift up a manhole cover and climb down. You don't have to believe me, and you could call me nuts, but it's my firmly held opinion that Dogman thrives in the sewers. The Uninvited Visitor Dear Scary Stories NYC, I live in a nice suburb of a large city in Pennsylvania. I've lived here for over 30 years. My wife and I moved here when she was expecting. Neither she nor the baby survived childbirth and I've been here alone ever since. My job took up most of my life, although I never rose to a position of prominence in my company. I've been laid off after 38 years in the pandemic and I'm looking into selling the house finally. I should have done it years ago, but I've been frozen in the past. My job kept me too occupied to have a social life, and I found out the hard way that most of my friends had really been friends of my wife, 
They tolerated me when they used to need to. It would have been a lonely existence if I hadn't been shell-shocked and numb through most of it. I suppose I'm finally waking up after almost four decades, and ironically, my awakening all began, in part, because of Dogman. This is not a story about how great Dogman is. It's actually horrifying to see. The raw power of the thing is unlike anything I'd ever witnessed. It's as fast and dangerous as a tiger, but it stands way taller than I do. I could never have imagined something like this could exist outside of a Ray Harryhausen movie. So, the house next door to me had been vacant for a long time. I think it was 10 or 11 years, but I wasn't really keeping track. There's a small patch of woods known in the neighborhood as the Cops that exists between my property and that one, so it's not as though we were immediately next door to each other anyway. When the new family moved in last autumn, I didn't even notice them until their second day being there. I admit, my first reaction to seeing them was disappointment, as I really had become like a hermit in some ways. But they saw me and waved, so I put on the smile I used for my bosses at work, and we walked over to each other to make introductions. Let's call them Lee and Leanne. They had a son old enough to carry boxes. I don't really know how to judge the ages of kids. I wanted to be polite, then get back inside to be alone again. But the two adults insisted I come over for some homemade pie. I asked them which of them made the pie, which was quite good. I got an answer so long that halfway through, I started watching the view of the fall leaves blowing outside the window instead. Somehow, they both made it, apparently. I don't really remember. The husband, Lee, offered to help me fix the gutters in the back of my house, which I had forgotten were sort of falling down. Instead of feeling grateful, I wondered why he was spying on my house, especially in the back. As if sensing my question, he told me he had a view of the back of my house from his bedroom. That confused me because there's no window in my house which affords me a view of his. I asked if I could witness this view for myself, and the two of them were only too glad to show me all the rooms in their upstairs. I was amazed to see that he was being honest. He could see the back corner of my house, and boy did it look run down and low class. I felt embarrassed and resolved to get it fixed for this new family's sake, if not for my own. Lee and Leanne were talented at fixing houses. Apparently, they survive almost entirely by upgrading properties and reselling them. As we got friendlier, I got both the exterior and interior of my home fixed up at a price I could afford thanks to the two of them. I began to feel both grateful toward them and protective as well. They were the first people to look me in the eye while talking to me since my wife, and they reminded me that I was, in fact, still a human being. One night, I was driving home in the dark and I saw some peeping Tom looking into the new family's front window. I beeped my horn and shouted at the window for the guy to take off, and he turned around to look at me. Only, when he did... He didn't look like any peeping Tom I had ever seen before. It was a dog, or it was some kind of a canine, and it began barking loudly at me, baring its teeth, and most undoubtedly and unquestionably, it was not a human being in any way. It was broad-shouldered like a man, but the torso thinned out almost like a greyhound's midsection does. It was a grayish-brown in color, somewhat like a duller, darker golden retriever. It was confusing how it was a dog, yet it was standing up like a man. It was terrifying how this hideous, huge thing was unafraid of me beeping at it. Instead of being spooked and running off, it had only grown angry. I wasn't sure what to do, so I rolled up my window and got prepared to try to drive away. The front door of my neighbor's house opened and the husband, Lee, stepped outside. That spooked the big canine, who ran away on his hind legs, at a speed that was almost as frightening as the realization 
that he was running in the direction of my property. Lee looked surprised to see me there and asked me what was going on. I told him I saw a big dog looking in his front window and beeped at it. Then it barked at me. He had heard both the beeping and the barking, but he didn't understand why I would beep at a dog. I told him that it was standing up, probably leaning against the house, and in the darkness, I had at first thought that he was a man. I got out of the car and walked over to show him the way the dog had been, but when I got to the front of Lee's house, I could see that I was in fact too short to recreate how the dogman had been standing. He was on the bottom two steps in the front of the place, and he had been looking in the top of the window. When I stood on those same steps, I could barely see in the bottom of the window. I tried moving up a step or two, but then I was too far to the left. The only conclusions I could draw was that either I saw some kind of optical illusion, or else that dog had to have been at least two and a half feet taller than I am. Lee didn't seem to doubt anything I was saying. He thought it had to have been an out-of-place wolf. There are wolves as large as I described up in Alaska. Who knows how one of them could have gotten to Pennsylvania. Not me, but if it's a real animal that exists, then any number of odd circumstances could have led to it traveling to someplace outside of its normal habitat. It could have escaped from someone who owned it illegally, for instance. Lee seemed concerned, and he thanked me for giving him all the details of what I had seen. He shook my hand and went back inside. I felt guilty, because I had only told him half the story. I had left out the part about him walking upright like a man. I traded my guilt for outright abject fear, when a low growling emanated from the woods to the side, and I realized the duck man hadn't left. He had just hidden and watched me talk to the neighbor. Apparently, it had unfinished business, and I hadn't left quickly enough. I backed up to my car, my eyes scanning back and forth in the darkness. The night turned wintry cold as all the blood inside me seemed to freeze. I experienced George Costanza-level shrinkage as my life flashed in front of my eyes, and I felt as though I had reached the end of my storyline. I didn't see anything strange, but I could still hear the thing as I dropped my car keys trying to unlock my door, which I had never locked in the first place. I got in the car clumsily, and I drove away slowly, trying to act as though I weren't shaking all over and weeping. I didn't know if the creature were following me home. As concerned as I had been for my neighbors, at that point I was hoping the dog thing went back to looking in their window. It might sound terrible, but I had gotten the thing mad at me. Unless you've gotten a nine-foot-tall monster angry at you, then you don't really understand what I was experiencing. I wanted to roll my window back down to listen for the growling, but I didn't have the nerve. I avoided my driveway and just drove onto my front lawn so I would have the shortest run to my front door. I got inside without seeing or hearing the dogman, and as I locked the place up, I began to breathe a sigh of relief. Then, I heard someone or something land loudly on the porch outside and run across it very quickly. It was terrifyingly fast and loud, but I hadn't seen anything when it happened. I had dropped to the floor, and I was panting in panic. Hyperventilating is what I think they call it. I had just begun to calm down when it happened again, this time coming from the opposite direction. This time I did see something grayish blur past one of the front windows. I have no idea what it was, but I sure know what I think it was. The next day was Saturday, and I was surprised in the afternoon when my doorbell rang. It was Lee and Leanne and their kid, and they came loaded down with gifts for me. They had decided it would be safer for all of us if we installed motion-activated lights around our properties that afternoon. This way, if we had a return visit from the giant out-of-place wolf creature, the high-powered lights would turn night to day and scare the beast off. It was an excellent idea, and I enthusiastically helped them set up around the perimeter of both places. 
when nightfall came. Lee ran around trying to find ways to walk onto his land or mine without setting off the lights. When we found those little spots, we adjusted everything until we were happy that anything larger than a squirrel trying to spy on us at night would get hit with enough photons to light up Broadway. It's worked so well that it's almost like that night of horror never happened. I haven't ever had a reason to let my neighbors know that the giant wolf I saw that night was bipedal, since it's never been an issue again. As I mentally prepare to leave this place, one thing I will never miss is the hideous, soul-freezing sight of the uninvited visitor. Skitsy the cat is not a cow. He's a cat to whom we say meow. Meow, 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 Skitsy, and tell your mom that the cinemas are closed and you're on to her. If you would like to be a Scary Stories executive producer like Skitsy, just be a cat and move in with a lady who upgrades to our $7 level in our channel memberships. Thank you, Skitsy and Mom. This is as good a time as any to mention that we are abolishing our $2 level this weekend. If that's you, you'll get a refund for your last month. The good news is that we're offering an all-new 99-cent level instead. At half the price, you can get access to our secret uncensored Dogman stories that we put out each Sunday night, which are far too wild to tell on this channel. We also have a new $10 level, which gives you everything, plus you get to watch our shows one day in advance. So in other words, you get to see Tuesday's show on Monday, as well as all the new secret uncensored stories and are over eight hours of archived secret uncensored videos. Find out more by clicking the join link under this video. And now for something completely creepy. I saw a UFO drop off a dog man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I had an incident about 12 years ago when I was a teenager that I still can't explain. I'll tell you what I saw, but I don't know how it could actually have been real. I was not the only one to see it though, so I wonder what really happened. If I were to believe my eyes, then I saw a flying saucer land and let out a dog man. One of my cousins used to live in our town and go to the same school as me. Let's call him Melvin. Melvin was a jerk. He would avoid me in school and hang out with this big mean guy that bullied me and my friends. I was so glad when Melvin moved out of town. The problem was, his mom and my mom had been close friends since childhood, so they would come back to visit our town for a week at a time. And when they did, Melvin was given my bed, and I was made to sleep in a sleeping bag on the floor next to him. I disliked this arrangement for so many different reasons, but most of all, it was because of how uncomfortable I was compared to that creep in my comfortable bed. He would laugh at me, that even my own mother prefers him over me, that she gave him the better place to sleep. I couldn't argue. It seemed like the world liked him better, and the bigger a creep he acted like, the more they would all be on his side. I began to wish his family would move to Australia so they would be too far away to visit. One night, I woke up and Creepy Boy was staring out the window and the room was brightly lit up. I told him to turn out the light, then I realized it was coming from outside. Getting up and standing next to the jerk, I saw what he was seeing. It was like some kind of Close Encounters of the Third Kind Douglas Trumbull light show. It looked like the cover of an ELO album, like a flying circular jukebox in the sky, and it was landing behind our house. The yard in back is about two-thirds the size of a football field, but this thing had enough room to land with plenty of space around it, so it couldn't have been all that large. It was flying saucer-shaped, but not a silver disc. It had many moving and flashing lights all over it. You would think that one or the other of us would run and wake up the adults when this was going on, but the thought never popped into either of our heads. In the years since then, 
I've read about people sort of entering into an Alice in Wonderland type vibe when these things occur. Possibly we were mesmerized by the experience. Or maybe we were just so taken by surprise by what we were seeing that it hadn't occurred to us to wake the others. Still, it seems strange to me. The remarkably bright UFO landed on the grass, and from behind it, a tall-looking, dog-headed, hairy Bigfoot with devil legs sort of snuck out, looking around and acting guilty. Both of us were like, whoa. So I knew we were seeing the same thing at the same time, and I didn't think we were hallucinating. Not back then, anyway. The werewolf or space dog or whatever it was didn't seem to be the pilot of the craft. It acted like an animal, not like an intelligent creature, and it wore no clothes. It had dog eyes, a dog snout, dog ears, dog fur. I mean, this was a dog, except the way it moved was standing up like a man. Really, he moved like a dangerous man, like someone I wouldn't want to mess with at all. I saw him scuttle toward the trees to get himself into darkness, which is where he seemed to belong. Then, the UFO saucer sort of became brighter for a second, and then flashed up in the air at a ridiculous speed. That was it. Silently, it was gone. At least I think I saw it fly up quickly. My idiot cousin must have blinked when it happened because he thought it just turned off. To him, the saucer just blinked out like a ceiling light when you turn off the switch. I asked him to tell me everything he had seen, and he said he saw a werewolf come out of a flying saucer. When I told him my version, I pointed out that I had never seen a hatch opening on the craft. I saw the werewolf-type monster emerge from the back of the UFO, but I never in fact saw it leaving the ship. My large and mean cousin said there was no difference between the two, but in fact, I think there's a big difference, at least potentially. It may in fact have emerged from a hatch in the back of the ship that we couldn't see, but it may have appeared in any number of other ways too. The entire experience felt like a show put on just for our benefit. The entire thing seemed staged, as though it were happening only for the two of us. We went outside in the night looking for landing marks on the grass. We found nothing. No landing marks, no scorched earth, no dogman footprints, no physical evidence at all that something had actually happened. So, maybe it didn't. Nick Redfern has written books in recent years insisting that militaries have experimented at points in our history by spraying an area with a rare airborne hallucinogen, then coupling the gas with some kind of projected laser light show. According to Redfern, people have been made to see various kinds of UFOs this way, and then the reaction of the people can be studied to determine if such actions might be useful in times of international conflict. Sometimes, you can use psychological warfare on your opponents and win with much smaller loss of life. Could what my moron cousin and I saw have been something like that? If so, we were never met with any men in black or government representatives asking us questions or anything like that afterward. If our reactions were studied, they were done in such an inobtrusive way that I literally have no memory of such a thing happening. So, what did we actually see? Was it really a UFO letting off a passenger who looked like a werewolf? If not, then what really happened the night that... I saw a UFO drop off a dog man. The slaughter of the lambs, lambs to the slaughter, or silence of the lambs. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I just left a job on a sheep farm in Pennsylvania. I want to stay on good terms with the nice people who own it, so I do not want to say which one it was. I think it's safe to give you the general area of PA that it's located in, though, which would be the land north of the big forests called the Roth Rock State Forest and the Bald Eagle State Forest. That's a pretty wide swath of territory, so it's not like I'm narrowing it down too much. I just want to make it clear. This took place in the country, 
not the city. And it's not very far away from protected land set aside for wildlife to flourish in. I mention this because I saw an animal that had to have been what people call a dog man. And I think it had traveled to my place of work from one of those two state forests. So we had been experiencing a situation where sheep were disappearing. Young sheep for the most part, plus one older one. The adult sheep in their prime seemed to be being spared from this problem, but their lambs and their elders seemed to be fewer in number about every three or four days. The sheep had all been tagged with locator beacons so they could be relocated if lost, but not one single sheep or sheep body was ever discovered after any of the disappearances. A co-worker we can call Andre, not his real name, and I got chosen for the job of putting up posts and attaching motion-activated cameras to them in order to monitor the sheep. We also placed some on pre-existing fencing, so we felt we had pretty much gotten the entire facility covered. The next time one of the sheep went missing, we felt sure that we would catch some video of the culprit or culprits. Soon, another lamb went missing, and Andre and I were set to work collecting the chip cards from each camera, then settling down in front of two large screen laptops and searching for a footage of the actual abduction or whatever had taken place. To our consternation and annoyance, the lamb in question was in some overnight footage and then never appeared again. In other words, however or whenever or wherever it had disappeared, None of the cameras had become activated, and there was no footage to explain what had happened to the lamb. One of the owners accompanied us as we took them on a tour of where we had the cameras set up, and the three of us tried to figure out where our blind spot was. It seemed reasonable to assume that there must have been an area where none of the cameras existed, otherwise how could we not have footage of what had happened? The tour ended with all three of us fairly convinced that there was no blind spot. It appeared we had every area covered, and yet the video of the abduction was not shot. So the owner gave us a number of additional cameras and instructed us to mount them in a few areas that we really already had covered, but from different angles. About four days after that work was done, another lamb disappeared. Andre and I once again collected the chip cards and the co-owners sat with us as we went through every second of footage. We found nothing at all. The lamb existed at a little after 2 a.m. but was no longer there by around 4 a.m. Andre looked through my footage and I looked through his but it was pointless to even go over it since we knew we had missed filming the crime once again. That lamb always stayed with her mother, and the mother was still there after the lamb was no longer. It was a mystery that truly bothered me and Andre, but was also causing a financial drain on our employer. The next step was to assign Andre and me to be roving sheep watchers on the night shift, a move that neither of us were very excited about. We had to stay up all night, keeping an eye on every young and old sheep to the best of our abilities, to see if we could capture any useful information with our roving night vision video cameras. I personally found it hard to even stay awake the first few nights as I adjusted to the new schedule, but fortunately for me, nothing strange happened on those nights. It was on the fourth night when everything went haywire. I knew of three different lambs in three different collections of sheep that were in my sector and I kept rotating through the three of them. I was on my second or third round that night when I saw something odd-looking off in the distance. It appeared to be a very large animal of some sort, possibly a bear. I turned the night vision camera on, and as I watched it warm up, the thing just blinked off. I tried it again, and just the same as the first time, the screen began to come on, then shut right off. This time I thought I noticed that the battery seemed to be showing no power. 
I took the battery off and put it back on, but it was no improvement. I could have sworn it was charged when I set out that night, and this had never happened to me before. Realizing I was not going to be able to zoom in on the thing from afar, I resolved that I would need to risk walking closer to the creature or person or whatever it would turn out to be. This was not something I was very happy about, and I knew I might be placing myself in danger. So I took my phone out of my pocket, meaning to call Andre. I was stunned to see the phone on, I forget, like 14% power or 4% power or something like that. Realizing I'd better hurry, I went into contacts as fast as I could to tap Andre's name. His name starts with an A in real life, too, so it's not like it took me all that long to look him up. Before I could call him, though, the phone blinked off, just like my boss's night vision camera had. That sent a chill through me because it felt almost supernatural or something. It felt like I was on that TV show where they stage scary events to see how you react to it. I swear I looked around for TV cameras. After not finding any, I shut off my mind to prevent myself from feeling any more scared, and I started walking toward the strange figure off in the distance. At first I walked in a way to try not to draw attention to myself, but then I realized there would be nothing wrong with that. Hopefully, it seeing me approach would make whatever or whoever that was aware that they had been spotted. Then they might reveal themselves more clearly as they retreated. At least, it sounded like a good idea in my head. So I began walking up a sort of an incline in the grass, heading up to where the dark shadow was lurking. And somehow, my fear was still at a complete minimum. It was just something I had to do for my job, you know, and the rest of my emotions were almost completely turned off. This was never something I would do if it were not something my boss needed me to do, and yet I was trying not to think about how scary this would be if I were in touch with my feelings. I'm not a good judge of distance, but let's say I was standing in aisle three at the supermarket and the big shadowy thing was uh, by the vegetable aisle. That's about how far away I was from it and I could start to see it a little more clearly. It seemed to be taller than I was by at least a couple inches, and twice as wide. Suddenly, silently, the form grew taller, or that's what it looked like to me at the time. I jumped a little backwards when that happened. It switched from dreamlike experience to full-on nightmare in that brief moment. It went from me wondering what that thing was, which was a couple of inches taller than me, to wondering what I was going to do about this something which was nearly twice as tall as I was. Needless to say, I took no more steps forward. I just stood there, staring into the darkness, wondering what I was looking at. I was imagining all sorts of different animals into that darkness, and none of them explained what I was seeing. It wasn't anything four-legged, that was for sure. So, what stands on two legs? Well, it was not the shape of an ostrich. It stood too straight and tall to be a chimp or a gorilla. I guess that left a bear. Bears sometimes do stand on their hind legs, so I was thinking maybe I just saw a bear in the shadows standing up. I began to back off slowly, keeping my eyes on the darkness in front of me. And as I moved backward, that shadow moved forward, stepping closer to me and into a better lit area. The step was slow and graceful, as though this creature were better suited for bipedal movement than quadrupedal. I was frightened of this hulking form moving closer to me, and I was terrified of the realization that this could not be a bear. It wasn't walking like a bear. And if it was not a bear, then that meant it was something completely unknown. And that tripled my fear level to the point where I thought I was going to pass out from the stress. Then, in the next second, I could finally see it. I could finally make out the form in full. The eyes reflected back a whitish shine from somewhere, making it a bit hard to see the features of the head. But the legs it stood on were a canine, not ursine. 
I mean to say it stood on dog legs, not on bear legs. It held its arms out in front of it, as if to show off the long white claws coming from the paws that almost looked like hands. Its dew claw was situated in a way to make it appear like a thumb. It looked like it could slice you to ribbons, and then it could pick you up to carry you off. Is that what had happened to the lambs? If so, why were we unable to locate them via their locator beacons? If this predator were taking them away with him, where could he be possibly taking them to? The creature walked a few more steps toward me and began barking and growling. It was a wolf of some sort, a giant wolf capable of steady bipedal motion. I could not even understand how I could be looking at this, but I backed away a bit more quickly. When I saw him sit down, in exactly the way all dogs sit down, I took off running away from him. I literally ran wee 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 all the way home. The next morning, I turned in my resignation. I told them what had happened, the power outages and everything, but I insisted that the real reason I was quitting was not because I got spooked, but because I had to go help a sick relative. I really did have an ill uncle, and I really did go from there to help him and his wife out for a while, but let's face it, that's not why I quit. I quit because of the giant dogman. I mean, I've seen that video on the internet of the dogman digging up the grave in the cemetery. That thing in the video looks around man size. In fact, it seems kind of like a skinny guy. This dogman, in comparison, looked like the Hulk from the Avengers movies. It's not something I ever want to see again. I got myself a job now where I work indoors, and that's fine with me from now on. Just because I saw that big dog man does not mean that I've explained what happened to those lambs. I mean, if they were taken away by him, we still should have located their remains via their locator beacon tags. Even if he tore them off the lambs, we should have located the discarded beacons. So I can't actually say that I know the dog man had anything at all to do with their disappearances. It hasn't actually been proven. I still can only guess as to the reason for the silence of the lambs. Don't go anywhere. We've got one more Dogman story for you in this episode. But first, I gotta say, he's the chef, umpire, and ref. He's our executive producer, Jeff. He's the guy who fits the bill. I'm talking about Jeff Underhill. Please join me in thanking our wonderful executive producer, Jeff Underhill, for making this episode possible. In return, he gets to see the links to our secret uncensored stories that we do each Sunday, as well as our over 15 hours of archived scary dogman stories. If you'd like to be as chill as Jeff Underhill, all you have to do is join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com, or else click that join link under this or any of our videos to become a channel member. Dr. Death will fill in the details at the very end of this episode, but now, let's jump to our next allegedly true dogman story, and we call this one African Werewolf Outside of Detroit? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I don't know if you've seen the recent internet video of a deceased werewolf in Africa. I saw it on TMZ. Supposedly it turned out to be a hoax, but I'm not so sure about that since about 18 or 19 months ago, I saw something still living, just exactly like that. And I saw it outside of Detroit, Michigan. I had some business at the sheriff's office up on Glengarry Road, just north of the city of Detroit. When I was done with my visit, the skies had darkened and it looked like it was going to rain. It had gone from a sunny summer day to a muggy, almost nighttime atmosphere. I walked toward my car in the parking area, and something caught my eye across the street. Over on that side of the road is the beginning of a natural area with lakes and woods and hiking trails, biking trails. It's really nice over there. Well, I looked across the street and right there, walking along the edge of the tree line from my right to my left as I gazed upon it, 
was a demonic looking monster creature exactly just like the werewolf depicted in that recent internet video. Only this one was fully alive. It had gray skin with dark patchy fur variously located all over its body. I might have thought it was a bear with mange, except it did not seem ill at all. It walked along at a healthy pace with a strong, sturdy stride, and it was motoring along on its hind legs as though that were the most natural thing in the world to do. Its head really looked like something out of the movie Dog Soldiers. It just looked like a werewolf from the movies. I thought about running back into the sheriff's office to get someone else to see what I was seeing, but I hesitated. What if I told them what I was seeing, and then the creature popped into the woods and out of view? They'd probably give me a breathalyzer test. I stood there, frozen, not knowing what I should be doing in that moment. Just then, a police car pulled into the parking area, and I trotted over to where the officer was parking his car. When he got out, he asked if he could help me, and I asked him, What do you see over there? Pointing across the street. What do I see where, he asked, and then he jumped a little, as I could tell he was seeing what I was seeing. So I was not imagining it. It really was actually there. The officer leaned forward and squinted. Then he stood up straight again. He put himself back in order, tried to look as calm as possible. Then he turned to look in my direction, but he was unable to look me directly in my eye. What do I see, he asked me back. I see the woods, and if I were you, that's all I'd tell people that I was seeing. It kind of sounded like a threat to me, but I was so flummoxed, I couldn't think of anything good to say in response. I think I said something dumb like, but, 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 as he ignored me and went inside the building, leaving me alone with the werewolf-type creature walking away from me across the street. I got in my car and resolved to drive over to the werewolf and get a closer look. I was too scared to approach it on foot, but I'm one of those people who feels kind of safe when I'm behind the driver's wheel in my car. So even though I actually needed to drive right, I drove left to have a chance for a closer look at a real-life werewolf. As I made the turn onto Glengarry Road, the creature sort of looked over its shoulder at me, and in one quick step, it merged with the forest like the two were one thing. It really looked like that, like the two morphed into one organism. Not like it walked between two trees and then out of view. It was like nature meets nature, or two amoeba becoming one. It's hard to explain, but it just looked weird. What I can tell you is that it was gray in color with dark patches of fur and spots on its body. It looked like the fur was pretty symmetrical in the way it was laid out on the left and on the right, so I don't think I was looking at a bear with mange. I think the hair was supposed to look the way it looked. Certainly the creature looked healthy. A bear with mange does not. It seems weak and ill. This thing was strong and muscular. It had no fear of me as far as I could tell. It just did not want to deal with me, and it did not want me to get a good look at it. You're the first people I'm ever telling this story to. The way that officer sternly advised me not to tell anyone sort of frightened me. Every time I think about telling someone the story, I chicken out and decide I'd better keep it to myself. I'm not sure why I'm afraid, except for the way the officer said that to me and the way he couldn't even look me in the eyes he was that afraid. I figure if a cop was that afraid of this thing, then maybe I should be too, you know? After all, who would believe me if I told them that I saw an African werewolf outside of Detroit? My cousin became a dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC I know that the general consensus is that Dogman is a kind of animal, either natural or supernatural, while werewolves are considered people who transform into animals, either natural or supernatural. But 
Werewolves are supposed to change back into humans the next morning, aren't they? I'm asking this question because I lived through my cousin's slow transformation into a feral, wolf-like creature. But as far as I know, he's never changed back to being my cousin. For this reason, I think it's possible for somebody to, for some reason, somehow, transform into a dogman. I am a guy who had a mostly happy upbringing in Maryland, but when I turned 21, my home life changed drastically. Although I was a junior in college pulling the same grades I always had and living the same life I always had, for some reason, my mother's attitude toward me changed drastically. She had always been so supportive and encouraging. She told me how to handle abuse from others. She taught me to always remember that I was a good person and I was placed here on earth to inspire others to be good as well. She repeatedly reminded me that I was humble and loving and productive and that those were the best qualities a person could have. Then suddenly, one day, out of the blue, she cut me off and became my worst enemy. She clearly hates me now, and the change came overnight. I tried to give her emotional support because she obviously seemed emotionally ill, but she rejected my efforts and called me useless and evil. I wondered what had caused her to change, but she insisted that it was me who had changed. So... I found myself out of college, and I found myself homeless. I turned to various family members for help, but they sided with my mother, who is the richest person in our clan. The lone exception was my cousin, who for the sake of this story I will call John. John had also been rejected by the family, and he was having a hard time surviving down in Florida. He had been given a trailer home by his parents and told to leave them alone. So, he was better off than I was. He was having trouble making payments, though, and he was going to lose his trailer home, so he welcomed me moving in as long as I got a job to help out with the bills. I got work at McDonald's, since I wasn't and still am not really qualified for much else. And we got along as well as two grown men crammed into a trailer home can get along. I think we both recognized that we each needed the other, so we cut each other a little bit of slack. Then John started getting sick. I took him to the hospital twice, but they diagnosed him differently each time. This was the first time that living under the poverty line came in handy since we didn't have to pay for his hospitalization. I really don't think the doctors knew what was wrong with him, but they gave him meds anyway. Both times the drugs made him sicker, and both times we flushed them down the toilet. Both prescriptions just helped him get more and more ill. John became convinced that he was not long for this world, and he was kind enough to sell me the trailer for a dollar. We transferred his monthly bills over to my name as well. He wasn't even 30 yet, but he was positive that he would be gone soon and that the doctors wouldn't even know why he had passed away until some time afterward, if they were even curious enough to wonder why. I tried to maintain a positive attitude and I would sacrifice in order to get him foods he liked and to make his remaining time less horrible. One morning, he woke up screaming and I rushed to him to discover something awful. His fingernails had fallen out and his body hair had started growing longer all over his body. He said he was itchy everywhere. That wasn't all of it. He had started to look malformed somehow, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I told him we should go to the hospital, but he told me he wasn't well enough to get out of bed. And besides, he didn't want any more of their poisonous medications. I typed his symptoms into the internet, and I got nothing back. What was happening to him shouldn't be possible. By the next morning, it was apparent that his body was becoming something other than it had been. The bones were reshaping themselves, I guess you could say. His arms and legs 
were not the same as they had been. My first thought was that it reminded me of that old Jeff Goldblum movie called The Fly, but not exactly. His face had distorted, and his teeth fell out. I thought maybe he had radiation poisoning. And just a couple of days after that, though, I was stunned that new teeth grew in. They didn't even look human. They looked more like an animal's teeth. Not only that, but his fingernails had been replaced by new ones that more closely resembled the claws of an animal than human fingernails. None of that happens if you have radiation poisoning. Things fall out, sure, but new stuff doesn't grow in. The hair on his head had fallen out, but it was replaced with this new hair that also covered his cheeks and his body. I didn't realize it back then, but I think his hair was being replaced by fur. The closest thing I could find online to what was happening to John was a disease called acromegaly. The body changes, the bone structure morphs, like the Elephant Man if you ever saw that movie. But this was just so different from that. Even though John claimed he didn't want any medical help, I called the second doctor we had seen at the hospital and I told him what was going on with the hair, the changes in bone structure, him growing claws. The doctor got angry at me and told me that it's against the law to make crank calls to a hospital, and then he hung up. Before he did, though, he told me that he knew where I lived, and if I called him again, he'd have me arrested. I don't know if he could have really done that, but I didn't call him back anyway, just in case. So it was really just me and John entirely on our own from then on. It wasn't long after that when John stopped talking altogether. I would bring him food and he would crawl to it and eat it like a cat or a dog would. I left him a bowl of water as well. He seemed to be in great pain, but he couldn't talk to me about it any longer. I'd hear him moan all night, but I think his mouth or vocal cords had changed so he was no longer capable of human speech. Either that, or his mind had regressed to the point of less than human intelligence. When a person only lies there whimpering and moaning, you can't really tell what they're thinking about, or if they're thinking at all. Then one day, he started to seem a little bit stronger than the day before. His face was distorted into something non-human, something that protruded forward, a hideous thing to see. He was becoming some sort of animal, and as his strength returned, so did his aggression. He nearly bit me one time as I brought him his dinner, and that was the end of me feeling safe around him. I found a sleeping bag in the trailer, and I hid myself in a nearby patch of woods that night to sleep outside. It was a short-term solution, but I wondered what I would do the next time it became rainy. Well, I didn't have to find out the answer to that question. After three nights of sleeping in the woods, I heard a huge racket coming from the trailer. I went and hid behind the garbage dumpster over there and watched as the whole thing bounced up and down like a war was being fought inside. Suddenly, the door flew open and what I can only presume was my cousin John came falling out backward. He seemed to have either leaned on the door or backed up into it, then fell out by accident. I don't think he understood or remembered that the door was even there. He was that far gone. As he climbed up to his feet, I could see that his body was now entirely covered in thick, dark brown fur and that he was no longer clothed at all. His legs had changed, but not in a malformed way. They resembled the back legs of a cat or a dog, and they were symmetrical to each other, not deformed looking as they had been when he was sick and transforming. When he turned around briefly, looking in all directions to get his bearings, I saw that he now had an entirely canine facial appearance. I don't just mean that his face protruded as it had for over a week, 
but now he had dark nose leather around his nostrils and he had a full dog-like snout. His ears stood up tall and straight on top of his head. Those were canine ears, not human ears. He seemed to still have hands, but now they were covered in hair or fur as I said earlier. The fingernails had been replaced with something much more like animal claws. Not retractable ones like a cat has, but dog claws. I don't recall him having a tail, but I don't recall him not having one either. I think I was more concerned with where he was looking, since I wanted to make sure he didn't see me. His eyes reflected back the available lighting, which I don't think a human being's eyes can do. He was not something I could even call human any longer. He had become something else entirely. The creature that was once my cousin spun around, and I moved backward into the shadows to continue watching him without him seeing me. Then, he surprised me by dropping to all fours and continuing to spin in a circle for a while longer. I thought he was insane at first, and then I remembered something I had once read. Dogs spin in circles in order to allow their internal senses to figure out the four cardinal directions. By doing this, somehow they learn which way is north, south, east, and west. This is key to their homing instincts, and how a dog can get lost hundreds of miles from home, yet still get back to its family anyway. The realization hit me so hard, it made me feel nauseous and ill. My cousin John had become some sort of a dog, or at least some sort of a canine. He abruptly halted his spinning, then tore off, still on all fours, right into the small patch of woods I had been sleeping in. It was shocking how fast he was able to move. Clearly his illness was over. He now had far more strength than he had ever had as a human being. Almost immediately he was gone from my sight. I took my chance and ran back inside the trailer, locking the door behind me. Inside, everything that could be broken was broken. I had put my laptop in a drawer before going outside, so that was still intact. All the glasses, bowls, and dishes that weren't plastic were in pieces on the floor. Some of John's belongings looked like they had been gnawed on, and that's probably because they had been gnawed on. His bed sheets looked like they had been ripped up with Ginsu knives, and I realized John's claws were deadly weapons. I shuddered all over looking at his ripped up pillows and blanket, realizing that that could have been me if I hadn't discovered his sleeping bag and taken off when I did then it very well could have been parts of me scattered all over the interior of that trailer. I nearly passed out when I understood that. I had come this close to becoming ground beef. It took me two nights before I could really clean the place up, throwing everything into the dumpster outside. I now live alone, thanks to John thinking ahead and passing ownership over to me while he was still able to think, and still able to do human things. I sat down and wept for his lost humanity. The two of us had been depersoned by the people we most depended on, but even that cruelty was nothing compared to what nature seemed to have done to the guy. I think I cried for the lost man because he had nobody else to cry for him. He himself wouldn't even understand the loss he had suffered. He would only exist in the moment from then on, functioning as a killing and eating machine. All he would ever understand again would be survival and nothing more. This is why I have no shame admitting my tears. We both had such hopes. We both had been honor students. We both had been thrown in the garbage, just as I was tossing his last few ruined possessions into the trash as well. It was such a deep tragedy to me, and yet, Nobody would mourn his passing. I was the only person who cared that he was gone forever, at least as far as I knew. But what if 
For some reason, one of our relatives came looking for him. What if the next black sheep to get cut off from family life came down here in the same way I had arrived? Or what if one of the neighbors in one of the other trailer homes saw his belongings in the dumpster and alerted the authorities that something strange had happened? What would I do under any of those circumstances? I decided that if anyone asked where John was, I would tell them the truth, that I saw him leave, and I hadn't heard from him again. So far, though, nobody has asked. When you're kicked out of your family the way he and I have been, you'll find that nobody cares if you go missing, nobody cares if you live or die, and that you have to be very strong just to get up in the morning. Either that, or you can become an animal as my cousin did. I have seen him one more time since then, so I don't think he's moved out of this area. It was about two weeks after he first ran off. I was coming back from work, and I saw him squatting at the edge of the wood line. I moved behind that same dumpster so I could watch him. He was holding something in his hands and eating it, but I couldn't see what it was. He had his palms turned upward, and whatever it was rested on those palms. He would lean his canine snout into whatever it was and chew away. Every so often, he would turn his head and look around the area, then return to eating. I didn't move until he was done, at which point he quickly stood up and bolted away, running back into the tree line and disappearing from view quickly. He is an animal now, no longer a human. And this is why I say my cousin has become a dog man. Update. A friend of mine from work had me over to his apartment, and we watched a movie together called Ginger Snaps. I hadn't told him anything about my cousin, so it was a pretty remarkable synchronicity that he showed me that film. If you haven't seen it, the story is about a teenage girl who gets bitten by a werewolf, then slowly turns into one herself. It happened so slowly over the course of days or weeks, it was just like how it happened with my cousin John. Some parts of the film made my hair stand on end, they were so similar to what I had seen happen with my own two eyes. She also gets really sexed up during the course of her slow transformation, which thankfully did not happen to John, at least as far as I know. So, in that film, you become a werewolf, then that's it. You never change back. It's not tied to the phases of the moon as I had half expected, being that it's a film written by a woman. Instead, the werewolfism is tied to being bitten by another person, who had already been changed into one of the creatures. You can slow down the process using a wolf's bane injection, I think, but apparently you can't reverse it. Now I wonder if my cousin is in fact a werewolf. I also wonder if all the dogmen that people see are actually werewolves too. Of course, if you're a werewolf that can't change back, you essentially are a dogman. How little we understand the world we live in. How little anyone understands this planet, even the people who claim to be experts. Nobody really knows what's going on. Nobody really even has a single clue. We live in a constant fog. Cousin John never mentioned anything about being bitten by a wolf or a dog or anything of that nature. Of course, I hadn't asked him if he had been, but you would think it would be something he'd have told me when he was still able to speak. Now I'm more thankful than ever that I got out of there before he bit or scratched me. I might be going through the same experience now if he had. But like I said, John never claimed to have been bitten by anything. Maybe an animal bite is not what caused his transformation. If that's the case, I wonder what did cause it. And if something other than a werewolf bite caused him to change, could whatever that was also cause me to change? Could it be something in the air? Or something in this location? If I disappear, 
nobody would even notice, except maybe the bill collectors and my manager at McDonald's. My mother and my family would never even realize that I had become a dog man. If you enjoyed that story, then please join me in thanking today's executive producer, Chris C., for making it all possible. Chris C., she leaves great comments. Chris C., she's always on it. She's as cool as she can be. Executive producer named Chris C., In exchange for her monthly contributions to this channel, Chris C. gets to watch our weekly secret uncensored scary stories, far too wild to tell on this channel. She also gets the links to our super long secret uncensored archive videos, including our brand new 6 hour volume 4, which includes all our secret episodes from December 2020 through July 4th of this year. We have 21 hours of archives so far, almost a full day of viewing for all members at the $3 level and above. You can see them all too if you go to peterbernard.com and join our PayPal subscribers club, or if you click that join link under any of our videos and become a Scary Stories NYC YouTube channel member. Haunted at Night by Dogman Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a story about an evil thing called a dogman. I'm telling you, it's not just a creature. It's not just an animal. It's an evil, rotten, horrible thing. It causes fear. It causes arguments. It robs a life of happiness. It ruins everything around it. I think somehow it feeds off of misery, but at the very least it causes all good things to turn rotten from the inside out. It's a nightmare come to life during waking hours. You may think I'm being dramatic, but I'm just laying it on the line. Those who expect that we'll one day find a dogman body, well, if we do... It won't be the kind of dog man that ruined my life. That creature was an abomination. It was a living curse. It had no positive qualities. And it ruined my life with very little effort for no good reason whatsoever. If you find yourself afflicted with the presence of a dog man the way I was, I pity you. I used to live in a nice little house that my girlfriend Heather and I rented in a small area called Ingleby, Pennsylvania. We both ended up with jobs within driving distance of the place, then found the house at a price we could afford to rent and moved in. There was nothing strange or weird or magical about the process of how we ended up there. Honestly, the entire town is really just a few houses set back in the woods. I'm not even sure it is a town, so much as it is a collection of a very few people. We both were from small towns in Pennsylvania, but this was the small towniest of small towns, if you could even call it that. We were located between Lick Hollow and Poe Paddy State Park, with very little around for miles and miles and miles other than hills and valleys and trees and animals and nature. Oh, and the dogman, of course. I personally am not sure if the dogman exists, even though I've seen him and I've been bothered by him. I mean, I'm not sure if he exists in the normal sense, like you or me or birds or plants or snails. I know he can come and he can exist inside your mind, I know he can occupy real estate inside your brain. If you're a true believer, try not to hate me for what I'm saying until you've heard my full story. I woke up one night to the sound of something tapping at one of our bedroom windows. We were sleeping up on the second floor of this house, and outside that window was just a small ledge angled down toward the ground. I'm not sure it would even be enough for a fully grown man to stand on. The shingled, angled ledge was that small. 
Nothing larger than a house cat should have been able to perch there. So in my mind, I imagined that was what I was hearing. A small animal like a squirrel tapping on the glass. I opened my eyes and sat up to look, but I saw nothing outside of the window. I heard it raining out there and I assumed I was hearing the raindrops tapping against the glass. So I tried to get back to sleep. Soon after my eyes were closed, though, that tapping came back, and it was clear that it was not a sound being caused by raindrops. Maybe whatever it was had been scared away when I sat up in bed. I decided to look again, but this time in a less obvious way. Curious, I opened my eyes just slightly, trying to make them appear to still be closed, and that was when I first saw it. A freakish-looking dog-headed man was outside that window, like something out of Hieronymus Bosch. It was a freak of nature, that's what I thought, and it brought fear with it. As I saw it for the first time, it was all I could do not to scream and run out of the room. And as I watched, as corny as this sounds, lightning flashed down behind it soon to be followed by very loud thunder, so loud that it woke my girlfriend Heather up. Seizing the opportunity, I nudged her and woke her up further. Look, I whispered, and she mumbled back, look at what? I sat up and pointed to the window, but of course, when she looked, there was nothing there any longer. If you mean the lightning, she slurred, I heard it. Now let me get back to sleep. I figured I'd better do just that and tell her about it in the morning before work. That's what I did. I told her as we got ready to head out to our respective jobs that I had seen a dog-headed man and it was tapping on our bedroom window. I said it had to have been balancing on that little ledge outside in the thunderstorm. Heather stared at me for a good long time then answered, yeah, I had weird dreams last night, too. It's the rainstorms. They give you crazy dreams. I started to insist that what I saw wasn't a dream, and she talked loudly over me to tell me how busy she was, then ran out the door. If I was ever going to be able to talk to her about it, I was going to have to get some proof before I began the conversation. Either Heather didn't believe such a thing was possible, or else she was frightened that it might be real. In either case, it was not something that she wanted to intrude on her reality. That night when we headed upstairs for bed, I brought my phone with me so that if the dog-headed thing returned, I could try to get a picture of it. Heather got extremely upset with me and blew up into an emotional fit. We had a deal, you see, to leave our phones downstairs at night. I was the one who had originated the idea because I felt disrespected when she would sit there in bed staring at social media when I wanted her attention. Since then, she had gotten used to it and never wanted to go back. In other words, she wanted us to be alone when we had our private time at night. No Netflix, no Amazon, no Twitter, no phone calls, no texts, and so on. I explained that I was only bringing it upstairs so I could take a picture of the dogman if he returned to the ledge outside the window. Oh, you're only bringing your phone with you to take a picture of your dream, she shouted. I insisted it wasn't a dream, then asked her if she had a camera I could use instead of the phone. She screamed at me that she didn't own a camera because she could use her thousand dollar phone if she needed to take a picture. I responded, well, that's why I'm bringing the phone and she looked like she was going to explode. I never saw her turn so red before, saying, fine, in a way that clearly did not mean fine. She stormed upstairs past me. I followed meekly, opening the camera app to get it ready, then placed it on my nightstand to be within arm's reach if I needed to use it. Then I turned to Heather to have some nighttime conversation, but she gave me the cold shoulder turning away from me in bed and acting like she hated my guts. It was extremely frustrating, and I already blamed the dog man for causing unrest in my home. I suspected that he was laughing somewhere, 
that he knew exactly what I was going through and that he was finding it entertaining. I woke up in the night to the sound of thunder, but when I looked out the window behind the bed, it didn't seem to be raining out at all. I may have heard the thunder in my dream. It might not have been real. I looked toward the side window, and there it was again. The dog-headed, hairy monster man. Keeping my eye on it and trying not to make any sudden moves, I slowly and carefully reached over and got a hold of my phone with one hand. The creature saw what I was doing, seemed to understand what it meant, and gave me a look of pure hatred. I got scared that it was going to come through the window at me. That's how angry it looked. But instead, it just sunk down below the window and out of my sight. I jumped out of bed, waking Heather, and stomped over to the window, snapping shots as I went. When I reached that window, I looked down to see where the dogman had gone. I couldn't see it at all, so I opened the window, pulled up the screen, and stuck my head out, looking down to the ground. It wasn't anywhere. It must have gone somewhere, but I don't know where. It really seemed impossible that I wasn't seeing it down below me. It hadn't had time to drop to the ground and run away. Heather erupted in fury, demanding I close the window before I let every bug in the forest inside the house. She accused me of being a moron, and an idiot, and a bunch of other fun things, too. Even after I closed the window, she was still muttering really rude and hurtful things under her breath. She was so angry that she couldn't sleep, so she got up to use the bathroom and stubbed her toe. Of course, that was blamed on me as well. But... Also, of course, it wasn't my fault. It was the fault of the dog man. The next night, we ate dinner together, but we didn't speak to each other except when absolutely necessary. We went upstairs silently to bed as well. I was allowed to bring my phone with me, but we had no conversation upstairs, and we just went to sleep. I slept through the night, and there were no incidents with the dog man. The following night, things were slightly better over dinner, but we both were tired from long, hard days on the job, so we went upstairs early and crashed out, sleeping. In the middle of the night, Heather woke up, screaming. I swear I thought someone was knifing her or something. She was screaming like she was starring in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot. I jumped up so high, I practically hit the ceiling, and I asked her what was wrong. The dog-headed man, she shrieked. It's the dog-headed man. He's on the ledge outside the window. I looked, and I saw nothing. All I could see out there was darkness and a tree, nothing out of the ordinary. Take a picture of it before it goes away, she screamed, and I did. I took a few pictures. Then I got out of bed to walk over to the window. I thought maybe I wasn't seeing it because I was at the wrong angle. Heather absolutely flipped out, yelling at me not to get any closer to it, that it was going to tear me to pieces. I walked over anyway, since I saw nothing there, and she began screaming like a banshee, just painfully loud, unintelligible screeching. It's gone now, you moron, she yelled. Let me see the pictures you took. I handed her my phone, and she flipped through various photos of the window with the tree outside of it. No, dogman, monster. I tried to say something, but she told me that if I knew what was good for me, I'd shut my mouth and leave her alone. The next morning, things were worse than ever. She told me I wasn't taking the relationship seriously. I asked her how she could say that, and she said, With my mouth, dimwit. I can say it with my mouth. Over the next few days, she only became angrier and angrier at me insisting I didn't get the picture of the monster just to spite her. I asked her how I could leave the dogman out of a photo unless he wasn't actually there. I thought it was a reasonable question, but to her, it was grounds to leave me and move back with her mother. That was the end of our relationship, and even though we had been together over two years, we were split up in just over two days. I would call her cell and she blocked my number. I'd call her mother's landline, 
and her mom would calmly explain that Heather would have nothing more to do with me. I couldn't afford the rent for the house alone, and I couldn't find anyone else who wanted to live with me in such an out-of-the-way place, so I was forced to move to a larger city and rent a room in someone else's apartment. I'm still there to this day, as I've had nothing but bad luck since our breakup. But I don't blame Heather for that. You know who I do blame, though. I blame the dog man. Thanks, dog man. Michelle, Michelle, she's so swell. Stitch by stitch, she's always rich. Please join us in thanking Michelle Rich for making this episode possible. She's our executive producer for the day. You can be our next EP by joining our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or by clicking that join link under each of our videos. Then you can see our secret uncensored Sunday stories, each of them far too wild to run on this channel. Henry Lee Dogman will have more info at the end of the show, but right now let's jump, and I do mean jump, into the story featured in our thumbnail. It takes place down under, and we call it Dogman versus Kangaroo. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I lived the first 18 years of my life in Michigan, wanting to see the Michigan Dogman. Then years later, when I was 40, I finally got to see him, but it was in Australia of all places. Let me tell you about it. My wife Jolene, not her real name, went to college with a young Australian woman and then they fell out of touch for years. When they met up again on social media, their friendship picked up where it had left off. Within a year or two, they were both talking about taking trips to visit each other either over here in the USA or over there in Australia. As it happened, Jolene and I went down there first we both wanted to see kangaroos and her friend Olivia lived in a town in New South Wales. She ended up driving us six hours into the desert one morning, telling us this was a good place to see red kangaroos. About a third of the way there we began to regret having asked to see a kangaroo as it was hot and there was no air conditioning in her old car. I began to wonder that her old heap would collapse while we were lost in the middle of nowhere and I stopped enjoying myself entirely. When we finally reached the place she wanted us to be, which, if I recall correctly, was called Living Desert State Park, we wondered what was different about that location from any place we had driven past on the way there. It looked exactly the same. Sand, scrub plants, and the hot sun beating down on our heads. Jolene and I were a bit cranky, but we had asked for this. Olivia told us that our best chances of catching a glimpse of red kangaroos would be at dusk, and then again at dawn. Sure enough, as the sun set and created an orange glow over everything, there they were. They were very far off in the distance, but they were there. Three kangaroos peeking up over the scrub brush at us. They were too far away to get very good photos of them, but we got to see them. It made the entire day worthwhile, and our moods cheered up significantly. Then that night, we lay on our backs and observed the stars overhead. So many of them. And so bright. We saw one star moving that seemed like it stopped every so often, and we wondered if that was a UFO. It was so tiny, though, that it might have been an illusion when we thought it was stopping. Still, it was a fun night for our imaginations, and we told each other spooky stories. We set up two tents, but they were so hot inside that we ended up sleeping on top of Olivia's beat-up old car instead. You don't want to sleep on the desert floor as you don't know what's going to crawl up inside your sleeping bag with you. So, we slept on top of the bags, on top of the car. It was such a steamy night there was nothing one could do in order to cool off at all. We all woke up about an hour before dawn to a hellish sound. I never heard anything like it before in my life. It turned out to be the sound a large bull kangaroo makes 
when it's furiously angry. <laughs> Off in the distance, about 100 to 200 feet away, there was a sort of boxing match going on. Only the two figures were swiping at each other, not punching. I thought it was two very large kangaroos, but when the one kangaroo leaped away a few jumps, the other figure ran after him on his hind legs. It wasn't a man, though. It seemed to be another animal. It had pointed, tall ears, but they were not as tall as the kangaroo's ears. It had a long snout, but unlike the kangaroo, it seemed to have fangs in its mouth. It looked like a cross between a kangaroo and a wolf because it stood upright like a kangaroo, but it walked and ran. It didn't jump. I tried to take photos. Jolene did, too. Nothing came out in the darkness. Our phones that we had in those days were not made for low-light conditions, and the creatures were just too far away. Both of the huge animals would run or jump for a while, then stop and attack each other with sharp and long claws. All the while, they were bellowing horrible sounds from hell at each other. <laughs> Finally, the dogman did something in the dark that caused the immense bull kangaroo to scream in horror and pain and begin a frantic, leaping, bouncing escape. The dogman pursued each of them traveling faster than Olivia's car was capable of going. We watched them run straight to the horizon line in what felt like only a minute. They were flying that fast. None of us could get back to sleep, and besides, we were completely shaken up by what had just happened. It was like we drank 20 cups of coffee. We decided to start driving back home right then in the darkness. It was a little bit cooler, and we figured that might give the old car a better chance of making it all the way back to civilization. My heart was beating like a bongo, and it didn't slow down until we were all the way back. I was convinced we were going to stall out and be attacked by Dogman, or by feral kangaroos. Australia is a wild place, far wilder than I had ever imagined. My sunburn never really turned to a tan. It just ached for days, then disappeared. And when we got back to the States and tried to tell our friends what had happened, everybody thought we were exaggerating or bragging. Nobody, and I mean nobody, believed our story about <laughs> Dogman versus Kangaroo. The Water dog man dear scary stories nyc i used to live up in murray kentucky in a house that was just a short walk through the woods away from kentucky lake on the other side of the lake was the land between the lake's national recreation area and we got all different kinds of wildlife going through our home we even got to see bald eagles which is sort of why to me that part of Kentucky is America. You can see elk around there. You can see bison. It's the real United States. It's the American dream in its original form. Besides the normal and expected animals, though, we would also see strange things that weren't supposed to exist. One time, my wife Mabel and I saw a thunderbird a huge giant bird with a 40 or 50 foot wingspan and it was gliding back and forth over Kentucky Lake. Now how are you gonna see something like that once and never again? Where does it go the rest of the time? Back to the Stone Age? Maybe so. It wasn't a pterodactyl. It was a bird with feathers and whatnot. How can something like that exist without being seen more than once in a lifetime, I ask you? Possibly Mabel and I looked back in time that day. I don't know what to tell you. I know you don't want to hear about no giant birds, though. I know what you want to hear about, and that would be the dog man. Well, we had sightings of those, too, or at least one of them. I'm going to tell you all about it, so sit back and get ready to listen. 
Even though we had air conditioning and cable TV and so forth in our very comfortable home, Mabel and I would frequently pitch a tent and spend the night, or even the weekend, on the beach just a short ways away from our home, and we'd sit there looking out at the lake. In the beginning, I'd always fish, but as we got older, I'd sometimes forget to bring my rod and reel with me and be too lazy to walk the five minutes back to the house and get it. When the weather's just right, the shores of Kentucky Lake are heaven down here on Earth. I have to say, getting that house was a godsend, and Mabel and I lived a blessed and happy life because of it. I had a drinking problem when we moved in, but it evaporated over the years just from the relaxation and beauty we got to experience every week over there. We also got along better and better as we got older, and I don't know how many couples can get to say that. So I appreciate Kentucky Lake and that entire region, and I miss it, sitting here alone in the old age home my grandson put me in after Mabel left us. It's better for him and his family to have that house anyway. Let the kids grow up knowing what true peace feels like when it's deep down inside you. Sometimes Mabel and I would take long walks on the beach. Some of the beach is privately owned, but we never got chased off by anyone. And at night, it felt like the entire lake was there just for the two of us. So on this one particular night, we saw someone flapping and slapping about in the water. It looked like they were trying to swim from the land between the lakes over to our side, but it looked like they really didn't know how to swim very well. Whoever it was, they were splashing water all around, and Mabel said, maybe we should help that guy out. He was swimming towards someone's short pier built out into the lake. It didn't have any boats tied up to it, and it was old, so maybe nobody actually owned it any longer. I wouldn't know. We jogged on up to the pier, and I called out in the water, asking the fellow or lady if they needed any help. Well, darned if they didn't stop flapping and slapping, and they calmed down and floated there in the water, just looking at us. And when the waves and the foam died down... We got ourselves our first look at the North American upright walking canine, a.k.a. the dog man himself. He was up to his shoulders in the water, just floating there, and he was looking at us with his head cocked to the side in that way that dogs do. The eyes glowed in the dark, but in a white or very light colored kind of way. Not like glowworms or anything like that. His eyes looked like little flashlights. That's what they mostly resembled. Mabel was like, It's a dog! But I could see the shoulders on it, and I knew it weren't no dog. Not a regular kind of dog at any rate. I said to Mabel quietly that it was time for us to go. But Mabel had been talking about getting a dog, and I could tell where her mind was going with this. She wanted to meet this dog and see if it would follow us home. With the kind of dog I suspected this one would be, the last thing I wanted was for it to learn where we lived. So, the creature starts doing its sloppy dog paddle and then begins climbing up onto that old pier. And when Mabel saw its upper torso was more like that of a big wet man than any dog that ever lived... She screamed her head off and started running back up the beach toward our tent. I ran after her, glad that she got to see that because I knew she wouldn't believe me if she hadn't seen it with her own two eyes. Well, that dog man seemed to think we were playing a game with him, or else he just thought we looked like game because he got up on the beach and he started running after us. Mabel was too busy screaming and running to see this, and for that I was grateful. She was scared enough as it was. When we got near our tent, I shouted at her to run home. She looked back at me confused, but then she saw it over my shoulder. That dogman was still chasing us, 
and out of the water it looked ten times bigger than it had when it was swimming. I thought the poor woman was going to faint, but to her credit, she tore off into those woods, heading for home. When we got back inside, she laid down on the couch as I went around securing all the doors and windows against break-in. Then, I loaded my rifle for bear and I walked around, peering out all the windows to see if the thing dared to come on up close to our home. I did not see it, but I knew that didn't necessarily mean it wasn't out there. People always ask me to explain what that means that we got chased by a dogman. Like, what is a dogman? What does it look like? I've read some about it and I know there are different types, but this was the full-on werewolf type. It weren't down on all fours, it was up in the air, and it had to be seven or eight feet tall when it was up there. It looked like something out of a 1980s horror flick. It was definitely not CGI, if you know what I mean. Plus, it smelled just like you would expect a giant wet dog to smell. Just repugnant. Disgusting. It looked stupid. I read people talking about how the dogman projects an air of intelligence. Well, this one looked dumb. And it looked violent. I don't know if it wanted to eat us, but it might have killed us just out of excitement like some big stupid dogs sometimes kill a rabbit then don't know what to do with it. I was never so scared in my life because it seemed kind of crazy and messed up on top of everything else. Its fur looked dark, like black, but it was soaking wet and this was night, so it might have had lighter colored hair in the daylight when it wasn't coming directly out of the water. It had a torso, like a man, like a big strong man, like a sideshow strong man, you know? I already said how its eyes were glowing and it had teeth as long as my fingers. It did not look like a plant eater, in other words. I got a good look at its paws when it started lifting itself out of the water onto that short pier, and those things very nearly resembled hands. They were not hands, though. They were claws, long and sharp talons that could slice and dice you if you let that booger get up too close on you. For a while... We were both too scared to spend the night on the beach any longer, but after a while we started spending the sunny days out there when we could. Mabel stopped going out there alone altogether, though, and I didn't really have a problem with that. I was very protective of her, and I didn't want to let her out of my sight, as she was a tiny lady, just a little under five feet tall. She hated when I would say that. She would always tell me, I'm five foot two, but in truth... That was only when she wore her three-inch heels. I miss her every day. So, we did see that creature one more time when we took a walk at night. This story isn't as interesting, really, because we saw him from a distance sitting on that same pier. He was staring out at the water, or maybe at the woods on the other side of the water. Anyway, the interesting thing was that he was sitting like a dog, not like a person. You know, his front arms were straight down and his hind legs were curled up behind him. He looked like a regular dog. I mean, a giant regular dog, but not like a man or a dog man at all. He looked deep in thought, which seemed to contradict my first impression of him as a big dummy. He sat there perfectly still, like some kind of Zen Buddhist meditation master. So maybe the dog man did have some depth to him. Or maybe he was just seeing himself a cat on the opposite side of the lake. I will never know. All I know for sure is that this dogman we saw those two times liked Kentucky Lake. His life seemed to be centered around that body of water, same as Mabel and me. When I visit my grandson every so often at that old house I gave to him and his family, I sometimes take a walk on the beach. Each time I'm kind of hoping I'll see the beast man and sort of praying that I won't. But every time I'm there, I'm certainly thinking about the water dog man.
Daniel D'Amico, Daniel D'Amico, wins more bets than Jimmy the Greco. He's the man who's got the plan. He's Mr. D'Amico, first name Dan. Please join me in thanking Daniel D'Amico for making this episode possible. Daniel gets to see our secret uncensored stories that we put out each Sunday night. Stories far too wild to ever run on this channel. He also gets to see our over 21 hours of archived scary stories, and so can you if you sign up at the $3 level or above with either of our clubs. You can either go to peterbernard.com and sign up to our PayPal Subscribers Club, or click that join link under any of our videos to become a Scary Stories channel member. Here's our old friend Henry Lee Dogman to fill you in on any details I may have forgotten. Hank? Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck 50 at peterbernard.com, and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. We're working on figuring out how to add the $10 level to the PayPal Club too. Hopefully that will happen sometime before August of 2021. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email, as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, we'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804-LA-SCARY. That's 804-537-2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back, and we can piece it together on our end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more. Scary stories.